Greetings, my friends. Welcome to another study through the Psalms. We'll be looking at Psalm 50 today. So technically speaking, we are one third of the way through the Psalms, there being 150 of them. So uh, number 50 today. It's written by a man named Asaph, who was a uh, worshiper at the time of David, songwriter at the time of David and Solomon. So Asaph writes this one. And uh, you'll notice that this uh, starts out with telling us that God is a judge. He is the judge. You know, it just reminds me that uh, Abraham referred to God, the creator, as judge of the whole earth. And sometimes I think we forget that, that there is judgment and there is a time of judgment in his patience. Um, he does not judge quickly. You know, he's very patient with mankind, and we love that about him, but we cannot forget that he is a judge, and this psalm will show that he will judge uh, those who are wicked. He, he speaks to two, diff two different ki kinds of people here in the psalm. That's religious people and wicked people. So let's go on with it. Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6, let me read. A psalm of Asaph, the mighty one, God the Lord has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let the heavens declare righteous, his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Selah. Think about that. Meditate on that. That's how it ends. God himself is judge. He is the judge, and he judges in righteousness. Oftentimes we do think that, well, he didn't get this right or he didn't get that right, but it declares in many of the Psalms that God does get it right. He knows how to judge righteously. He knows all the information. But he begins, and, and Asaph refers to God as the mighty one, God the Lord. And he says that he has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. It just means to every inhabitant of the earth, not just Jewish people. He's speaking out of Zion and he's shining forth from Zion. But it says that he is speaking and it literally means in the Hebrew, he speaks and he summons. So there is a time when he is silent, and we're going to read that later on, but there's a time where he won't keep silent. He says that in verse 3, Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. And so he says, A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous. All around him he is going to judge. And he, he talks about fire. You know, when he judged the earth the first time through. How did he do it? He did it with water. He flooded the earth. But um, it says, it tells us that the next time he will never flood the earth again, but he will cause it to, it'll be by fire. Okay. And so it says a fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous all around. Judgment comes and it's, it's heat. Second uh, Peter 3.10 Peter tells us, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And uh, if you go further on in that, uh, in that chapter in 2 Peter, it tells us about that fervent heat. And it tells us that those who know him, we should be aware of that and that our conduct as Christians in this world should be conduct that's pleasing to the Lord. So that's what this is about. In verse 5, it says, Gather my, gate, my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Now, the Jewish people knew about sacrifice. There was a covenant 
uh, and they were supposed to tell the rest of the world about this covenant by sacrifice. And so they had that, but we have that too. But we don't go around sacrificing animals, do we? That's because we have the perfect Lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ. So it's the blood of Jesus. And I like that it says to gather my saints together to me. Bring them to me. And I believe that we are going to be gathered to the Lord. But let's go on in, in, in uh, uh, Psalm 50. In verses 7 through 15, he begins to speak to another group of people. And as I said, they were religious types of people doing a religious activity, uh, lots of ritual with no meaning and no heart in it. So maybe you can just see that, no heart in it at all. They were just going through the tradition of it all, the motions of it all, and it, it really didn't mean much to the people. And God said, what kind of sacrifice is that? And that's what he's going to say. Verse 7, Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. He's the one who told them and instructed them that they should do these things. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. And, you know, there's no sacrifice that you can actually make to me, because I own everything anyhow. I don't actually need anything from you. And, and so you're just going through the motions. I, and like I said, he had told them to do these things, but their heart was not in it. You know, their heart was far from him, and they were just going through the motions and activity. And, and, and that should be something that we are reminded of, too. Are we just going through the motions, going to church, uh, even reading our Bibles and praying? Does it mean anything to us? Is it from the heart? Is, is, is your soul in, involved in prayer and in reading the Word? I mean, do you actually get anything from it? Or are you just going through the motions? I think I'll read uh, the next chapter today. I'm going to read five chapters in uh, Psalms and one chapter in the Proverbs and one chapter in the New Testament. But after it's all over, you don't actually know anything that you read, but you did it. That's the kind of activity that God's saying, hey, what's the matter with you? You know, does he take delight in that? Uh, he said that every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains. There's a lot of birds in this earth, and he knows them all. And the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. Will I eat the bull, flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Does this sacrifice mean anything to me? Does, do, do, do you're going through the motions. Does that mean anything to me? That's what the Lord is saying. He says in verse 14 and 15, Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. So he starts out with, hey, why don't you just start out with thanksgiving and re recalling all the things that God has done for you. Yesterday, today, um, you know, a week ago, a month ago, 10 years ago, when you were 5, when you were 10, when you were 17, when you were in trouble, did He deliver you? And uh, we just should go to Him in, 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 with a grateful heart. I think of that with uh, David when he, it says in 2 Samuel 18 that he went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I? What is my house that you have brought me this far? And I just love that. I know I've repeated it before, but he just goes in and sits down. I'm blown away by what you say you're going to do for me, that you're going to make me a royal dynasty. And I can't believe that you even took me from the shepherd's field and brought me to a palace. And he said, who am I? And sometimes I think we need to offer that kind of thanksgiving from the heart. It all has to do with the heart. The Lord is saying to these people, I need your heart and not your religious activity. Mark 12, 30 says, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. This, this is Jesus talking. When they asked him, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with, with what? With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. I think that means every single part of you, spiritual soul, your heart, your mind, your thinking, your, your physical strength, all of your strength, love the Lord. That's the first commandment. And so that's what God is saying to these uh, religious people. But we'll go on. Verse 16 through 21 speaks to another group of people. And these are people that are superficial, um, hypocritical, they may know the Lord, or they may know His Word, it seems to indicate it here, but they don't have any great regard for it. I remember when Jesus said, I believe it was Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, um, you do all these things, but I don't know you. See, and that's just it. Um, this, these are superficial worshipers, and even God calls them, He doesn't, He's not nice. He says, you're wicked. In verse 16, But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? You don't listen. You don't hear. You don't want to hear. When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. They may have heard the truth, may even say that they are believers, but yet their conduct... Their manner of living does not match up with the Word of God. And he speaks of it here. You, you consent with thieves and robbers. You have been a partaker with adultery. You, you give your mouth to evil. You speak evil things. Your, fr your tongue frames deceit. Is that what a Christian is? That's not what the Lord wants His, his children to be like. Speaking against your brother, and we can do that so easily, you slander people. I mean, do, who, who is the slanderer anyhow? It is Satan himself. He slanders, he accuses man before God, and he slanders God before man. He's a slanderer, and we don't want to be like him. And God knows it, and he sees it. And, and it says here, I kept silent. You know, he's patient. And we're going to see that in a few moments. But he, you think that because he is patient and he hasn't said anything or nothing has happened, you know, lightning doesn't come down out of heaven, doesn't strike you or anything like that. Um, he's kept silent. You, you think that that silence is, is like approval. I kept silent. And because I was silent, you think that I was approving your behavior. And he does not approve. He is, pa he is silent because he is patient. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, that's why he is silent. He is waiting for us all to come to a place of repentance. He is good. He is, long, he is patient. He is long-suffering. And so he doesn't strike us down when we should be. And uh, so, so if you're involved in things like this, man, let the conviction of the Holy Spirit hold you up, huh? And, and, and stop you, you know? Just because you haven't got caught doesn't mean that he approves of the behavior. Romans chapter 2, verses 4, and, and in the, these verses, I, I encourage you to read them all because it does talk about those who are uh, uh, judging others, but they themselves are involved in 
the same sinful activity. Romans 2, 4 says, Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? It's not the threat of a lightning bolt or discipline that is going to bring you to repentance. It is His goodness. And so that silence and that patience that is supposed you're supposed to hear okay god's been good but there's going to be a day when he judges and he says that verse 5 of romans 2 but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart you refuse to repent you are what treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of god again god is the judge and while you're doing this, you think he's approving, but actually you're storing up wrath, wrath for yourself. You're treasuring it, it says, <clears throat> and it's piling up, and there's going to be a day where judgment comes. You cannot escape God, God's judgment. The last two verses of Psalm 50 say, Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Speak about judgment. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. So he, he, he says, consider. Consider all these things, especially if you, you know, forget God. Now, maybe you say, well, I don't forget. I think about God every day. But you forget him in your conduct and your daily life. And he says, judgment day is coming. But whoever offers praise glorifies me. So you come to him, and then it says you order your conduct aright. Your living, your manner of living matches up with your love for the Lord. And it says, I will show that person <clears throat> the salvation of God. Praise the Lord. And so uh, let's end with prayer. Father, we thank you today for this psalm. We thank you that uh, it brings to us the reality that you are judge. Every man shall be judged. But Lord, because we know Jesus Christ, uh, Lord, Jesus took our judgment upon. We, our works will be judged. And I believe that uh, things like this will, will show up. And Lord, we need to be ordering our conduct to right. And I do pray that each one of us would, from the heart, love you with all our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength, everything. And Lord, I pray that you bless your people today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless and have a great day.